afternoon, July 24th. We are picking up in Revelation 22. We'll look at verse 3 word by word, but we'll just review one and two quickly because we are talking all the way over in eternity future. Because we're in eternity future, we don't know everything. We don't know it dogmatically and, and where we can say it real accurately, but we've got a great glimpse. That glimpse comes from the first-hand eyewitness view of Yohanan John. That still amazes me. 95 AD, and he saw was beyond 2019 AD. We'd have to go to 3019 because we have to go past a thousand years of millennium, and there's still a little bit of time because there's the tribulation time. You know, we're talking, he saw over 3,000 years as if they'd already been. That's an amazing plan by an amazing God that does blow our minds. Mm -hmm. And as we spoke last week, we saw that uh, there is a river. That river is a source of life. We talked about how it, it bubbles up and refreshes and renews and is sparkling and gorgeous. And it creates the, with the Shekinah glory, it creates, I believe, splashes of rainbows all over that will be seen forever. And those are his rainbow, not what man's trying to do to it right now. Mm -hmm. But remember, God said, I give to you my bow. That's how it comes out of, out of Genesis, out of, out of Bereshit. I give to you my bow. So that's God's, and I'm claiming it for him. And we saw that uh, the, the water came, proceeded from the throne. So we know there's a throne. We know that there is a street. We know that there is a river. We know that there is a tree of life. And this tree of life bears different kinds of fruit. Now, we talked last week, is this symbolic or is it literal? And I tend to think it may be both, that we may have something literal here, but we may have a lot of symbolism here also. That's where I say we can't be 100% just dogmatic and say this is exactly how it is, especially because when we know it talked about the leaves uh, the trees were for the healing of the nations during the millennium. We know that it sounds also like it, the, the, the leaves or the, the fruit is for sustenance, yet we know we are beyond what brings death, what brings sickness. All that's gone now. That's why we don't know quite how to comprehend this. But we do know that God's original plan for man was to live forever, and at that point it was that he would continue living by eating from the tree of life. And that was prior to sin, prior to that death, prior to that the, the diseases and the sicknesses. So in some way, I think we just don't quite know how to understand it. The same way we really do not understand the triunity of God, but we believe it. The same way that, that you sat down on that chair today and you did not take it, turn it, look all over and worry about it and try it out and see if you were going to hit the floor. You took it by faith. We know that there is air between us right now that we are breathing and we don't worry. <gasps> is it going to be there? Do I need to hold, you know, get all I can get in? Maybe it won't be there in the next moment? No. We know that God has ordained it to be so. And if we will breathe as long as he gives us the ability to breathe. When he says life is over, I don't care how much air is in between you, it's not. So we, my point is, let your mind go, let it be creative, and at the same time realize, I feel like I'm about like my little eight-year-olds when I taught third grade. Imagination runs wild, love it. We're trying to understand what to that eight-year-old was an adult world, well, I think we're the eight-year-old in God's world. We just really cannot get there. So we're going to go on and look a little bit more at what is there, or as I really ought to say, because we're starting in verse 3, what is not there. And I love what's not there. I think that's more important to me than what is there. Because we read right off the top, there will no longer be any curse. I thought we had already covered that when I said that, but we, we did somewhat. We'll cover it a little better right now. The curse, what are we talking about? Not just the curse on man, but the curse on the earth also. Go with me to Romans chapter 8, 19 to 23. Romans 8, 19 to 23. And we know Romans was written by Shaol Paul. He gives us a lot of uh, our foundation and what we believe in, in his writings. 
And here he's going to give us some real insight to creation. In verse 19 of chapter 8, the book of Romans, we have, For the anxious longing of the creation waits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will also be set free from its slavery to corruption into the freedom and the glory of the children of God. Did you catch that phrase, slavery to corruption? This world deteriorates also. We know that. We see death in creation, don't we? We see trees die. We see flowers die quickly. As soon as they're cut off, they start dying, even when they're not cut off. We see death. We what see is that Romans? Yes, it's Romans chapter 8. We, I start with verse 19. The, the phrase I, I'm pulling out, slavery to corruption, is verse 21. And it's going to change from that into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. Well, we're part of that children of God. The glory is the Shekinah glory that we will be reflecting. And remember, when we're in our glory in heaven, we're not aging. We're not dying. We're not suffering those ill effects. That's what it's saying is going to be for creation also. We're not going to say, oh... Look at that young tree. It dried up of its roots and it fell over or it blew over from a storm. None of this will happen anymore. I can't begin to imagine the gorgeous world this is going to be without the ill effects. Wow, what was the garden of Eden like? Wow. Okay, verse 22. We know the whole creation groans. It suffers the pains of childbirth together until now. Well, that's not light pain. <laughs> That's severe. All of creation is moaning and groaning. Not only this, verse 23, but we ourselves having the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our body. Now when we are adopted by God and we become His children, we know that we become joint heirs with the Messiah. We know that everything belongs to the Messiah. If we're joint heirs with Him, that means it's all coming to us also, that we are going to be part of all of this. And I love that part that says the redemption of our body. Now, I hear my mom over and over and over as she aged. I can't wait to get my new body. <laughs> I'm not as far along as she was at saying that, but I already have enough aches and pains, and I can't wait for my new body, for one that doesn't hold us back from doing what we want to do, one that doesn't get tired, even in the service of the Lord. We don't grow tired of the service, but we can grow tired in it just because we're human. I'm tired of needing to sleep at night. That's wasted hours of my <laughs> And I fight it like it, it's my enemy instead of embracing it like a friend. But when we're in eternity, when we're in this stage, we don't need to go to sleep. We don't need to bandage up something hurting. We don't need to go to the doctor for surgery. We don't have any of that happening in our bodies. And yet, I want to take you to one more important word because there's also that word redemption. And that takes us far beyond the physical that I'm talking about. That pales in comparison to when you think about being redeemed by the blood. That is the amazing. Remember with that new body doesn't have any blood in it. This body, the life of the flesh is in the blood. And God said, I gave you that blood on the altar. I gave it to you for the forgiveness of your sin. We know he was referring to the sacrificial blood of Yeshua Jesus, even though that was written by Moshe in, in uh, Leviticus and Viagra, chapter 17 and verse 11. Thousands of years before it would be carried out, God said it as if it was so. The same way Yohanan saw our future as if it were so. And all of that's packed in this verse. All of that's reminding us and we're going to have that new body that's the body like Messiah's resurrected body where when he resurrected and was a bit in his glory, not as much glory as we see returning from heaven, but still a glorified body from what died, we know that he was flesh and bone. He had spent his blood. There's not blood to spend again. It's not going to happen again. Remember, there's no light entering in again. There's no repeat. There's the taught to us, history repeats itself. You hear that over and over and over again. Israel will bring out Jewish history to keep it from being repeated. 
We need to remember less to happen again. So we remember and we remember. And here, all of that is let go of. All of that is gone. And we just deal with glory forever. Can you wrap your mind around that? Does that not excite you? Doesn't it excite you enough that you should be thinking in your mind, oh, I want so-and-so to share that with me. That's what should light the fire under us. Don't hold it to yourself. Don't be selfish. If you've got something that great, get it out there. Share it with them. I love to say to an unsaved Jewish person when I'm witnessing with them, I know Israel's future. It's good. I know who wins. It's Israel. The reason why Israel wins is because God put his name on her. God said, I'll never make a full end. And then I get to witness about my God. Use what you've got. When somebody's telling about all their aches and pains, tell them, you know what? I'm with you. I got those aches and pains too, and I'm looking forward to the day. I know I won't have an ache or a pain, and I'm not going to be lying six feet under. I'm going to be soaring above your heads. <laughs> Use it for a witness. Embrace it. Let it warm you. Let it get you excited. Let it, let it stir in you. Because that's the Holy Spirit stirring up in you that you might carry it out. Wow, what we've got planned for us. I can't wait. Come on, boy, let's get it on. <laughs> okay, now, death is part of that curse. The curse was what came on the earth because God brought curse on the earth at the same time that Adam and Eve suffered the curse. God said the earth was going to be cursed for their sake. They'd have to work. They'd have to be toil, bringing it forth. Women would have toil or, or um, pain in childbirth. We know that to be true all the way down to today. All of that was part of it. But remember, we see in the millennial, we see a, a portion of that curse gone. In eternity future, we're seeing it all gone. So when you read like in Isaiah, and let's go there, just so it's crystal clear to you. Yeshaya, Isaiah 65. And the reason why I'm saying this is I don't want you ever to say, well, wait a minute, scripture's contradicting itself. No, it's not. During the millennium is not eternity future. It's great. It's better than now, but it's not as good as it's going to get. So, Yeshaya, Isaiah, chapter 65, we'll look at verse 18, and we read there, be, But be glad and rejoice forever in what I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem for rejoicing, for people for gladness. Uh, and then verse 20. Yeah, let me bring up verse 20. That's where I can bring up my point. No longer will there be in it an infant who lives but a few days, or an old man who does not live out his days, for the youth will die at the age of 100, and one who does not reach the age of 100 will thought to be a curse. What's it saying? You can live a thousand years if you don't act out in sin during that time. So if you die at 100, it's like a child dying today at 10 years of age. It's like a baby dying in youth, and, and we feel robbed. We feel like their life was stolen from them. We feel like it was cut short. So someone will read this and say, well, now, wait a minute. You just told me there's no curse. You just told me there's no death. What about this? Well, that's because the millennial kingdom is better than what we're suffering right now. But the millennial kingdom is not eternity future. There's still Satan in the abyss who's going to come out and get people to follow him. There's still a curse of sin on the earth. So even though it's better, it's not best. We see it getting to the best. And we know our future is the best. Okay? So just so you make sure that you see the difference. And if you want to know, since I said it, I won't take the time to look it up, but where God said that he cursed the earth for man's sake, that's Bereshit, Genesis chapter 3, verses 17 to 19. Okay? It's on your cross-references if you have that. So having said that, let's go back to Revelation. Let's go back to the, the eternity future that I am so looking forward to. And hope I'm awakening that in you if there's any need to awaken it. And we are reading, where am I in verse 3? Oh, we're almost to the throne. We are there. Well, there no longer be any curse. We've covered that. And the throne of God and the Lamb will be in it. Notice it says the throne. It doesn't say the temple. Because it wasn't that long ago. We were in chapter 21. And you can peek back, 21 and verse 22. And it tells you when Yochanan was saying he was looking around, he was looking, he said, I don't see any temple in it. Because there is no temple. Remember the temple? There was a temple in heaven that the earth was patterned after. But when we're into the new 
heavens and the new earth, we're into a time where there is no temple. There is still a throne, but there is no temple. Okay, well the temple was replaced, I'm going to put it this way, it's replaced by the whole city, by the whole new, new Jerusalem. The whole new Jerusalem is like the temple because the glory of God is there and it's filling the place and there is that oneness that is there. God's continuing to rule. We've got the rule of God. It's not that he's not on his throne. That's why we see his throne. In fact, we see, and I'm going to point it out in a moment, that the throne is of God and of the Lamb. And I'll talk about that in, in just a moment. But here is my point. They would go into the temple to go in to worship God. Well, now the worship is open through all of New Jerusalem. The whole place is like being in the temple of God. So it isn't the temple with a mercy seat and all of that, but it's the very presence of the one who we are worshiping forever. Okay, so there is still a throne, but not a temple. Now, notice the, the specificness, if I can put it that way, of scripture, and I love this. I love how exacting it is. When we read about that, it says, and the throne of God and of the Lamb. Okay? We notice that it's saying there's one throne. But you notice there's two people. Now, notice the next phrase, and then we'll talk more about that throne in a moment. But the next phrase is, and his bondservants will serve him. If I was speaking to you in good English, and I said, Dora and Pam are going to be sitting on a throne and she will rule from it. You would come back to me if you're an English teacher and cross out the she and put the word they, wouldn't you? You, see, you can't do a singular pronoun when you've got a double noun. You've got two people, you've got one singular pronoun. Doesn't work. So what's being pointed out here? The one. Exactly. The scripture is specifically calling God and the Lamb as one. He will sit on his throne. Even though we see them personified in that too, we are seeing, excuse me, we are seeing the uh, singleness, the unity, the oneness. And we're going to see that again and again and again as we finish up chapter 22. That's why I bring it out. Those of you who are here in the beginning, do you remember chapter 1? And how we saw that in chapter one, the unity between the two continually. So the book starts with it and the book ends with it. And it brings it out so exacting. And then when I take you and we start in Genesis and we start with the very beginning, we're going to see it starts the same way. It's going to refer to God as Elohim. In Hebrew, that I am that makes it im on the end makes it plural. So if we literally translate from the Hebrew, which we should say in the beginning, God's created. But if you say that to, to a Jewish scholar, it goes, ah, 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 that's God. And if you ask them why, some will give you the excuse, oh, God is so majestic that when we speak of this majesty, this king, he's so great, we speak of him as more than one. We speak of him in plurality. Well, then carry it out and put the verb or put the pronoun in plurality and then also why do we not because he's pointing from the very beginning this oneness awesome awesome isn't that the prayer in the shema yes the is that the prayer in the shema yes hear o israel the lord our god the lord is one and yes shema yisrael adonai elohim adonai echad and i brought it out before but yes very clearly because that word echad is that one that can be divided but it's one, like an egg. But you can have a yolk, and you can have the whites, and you can have the shell, but you've got one egg. The other word for one, yahid, is singular. It's something that can't be divided. I've got one cup. I can't divide this cup. So I would call this cup a yahid cup, a single cup. But when I talk about God, I can't talk about him, because scripture never does, in the word yahid. When Abram was told to offer up his only son, it was Yahi, your only son. That God always refers to himself in that plurality, in that that can be divided, because we know he is showing us the triunity of his very being. And yet at the same time where our picture falls short, is when I pull that egg apart into three parts, they're not three equal parts, and they're not completely contained within themselves. They each need the other parts to make up one whole. 
that's where my picture just crumbles because nothing on earth will equal our God and his triunity. So if, if it was perfect, the whole white and the whole yolk and the whole shell would be a whole egg also and yet still one. And they'd all be equal parts and yet still one. There's no example of that anywhere on earth. This is where our faith steps in to understand what is beyond a man's understanding. And again, if we could, we got God on a human level. And no, thank you. <laughs> yes, sir. Yeah, in that song, you know, uh, how great our God is K double L O I, the A K at the end. Uh -huh. That like saying one or that same saying Elohim or Elohim is the plural. Elo ha El is God. Um, okay, I that's have what to break it down. Like you're saying with the A at the end. Um, the A is not plural. It's singular. Um, how great is our God? Okay, you know, and see, now we've about. got the plural, we've got the plural pronoun again. But Elo, Eloha, I, I think it's showing there, and, and it's not using either word, you know, we're not using the word once, we're not using Yahid or Ahad, but what we're seeing is, again, um, I, let me go into my Hebrew, let me go study that a little bit better to answer you better. But, but we have many names for God. Yeah, they, they don't all show the plurality. Ses ha Elohim, Lamb of God. We see Him in that one. We see that plurality again. But Elohe or Eloha, um, I'll have to go study it. Whether how we define a word in Hebrew to see whether we're looking at the plurality. I think we have to be because I know anytime God uses His name, He uses it in plurality. He shows you know that He is more than yeah. confined to the one. Yeah. Good question. I'm. That's where I need to grow my Hebrew. I'll come back to you with a better I'm answer. To learn. <laughs> I'm sorry? I'm trying to learn how to Yes, the, the yes, that's how we learn. We ask. Yeah. That's how we learn. And I'm not afraid to tell you, I do not know it all. <laughs> and I love to learn. Um, but you're on the right track. You're definitely on the right track. So, yes, we are seeing that, that plurality. We're seeing that we've got God the Father, in essence, Jehovah, and God the Son. Um, we'll, let's go to chapter 5. We've got the Lamb. And we've got God the Father. We see the two of them in chapter 5. Both sitting on the throne. Again, I see that throne wide enough for two, like a love seat for two. Equal sitting on the throne, and they're looked at as one. As the one God ruling them. There is a great tract out called, Do Christians Worship Three Gods? And Jewish people sometimes believe that they do because they hear us talk about God the Father. They'll hear God the Son. They'll hear about the Holy Spirit. Yet this shows them how the three are in one. That we don't worship three different gods. No. We worship one God who presents himself in three different ways. Yes, Kathy. If the names in the Old Testament where he revealed himself as one or three in one, why have they not? Why did that? Because be? like I said, the, the most common excuse they give is he's majesty. He's beyond what would be one. So we put him into the... Plural, because it's, it's the majestic we. Yeah. Sometimes you'll hear people say, you go to the doctor, how are we feeling today? You want to say, doctor, wait a minute, it's not how are we feeling today, it's how am I feeling today. But they'll use that. You know, well, that's kind of the idea. They'll say, you know, God is just so great, we can't confine him to one. But yet, they believe he's one. They believe he is just simply, you know. See, they even, maybe this will help you understand, they even look for the Messiah, but they believe that Messiah can be, there can be more than one Messiah. There's, there's this coming great one that hasn't come yet, that they're not realizing that he's going to be very God himself, that he's on that level. We have to show them from their own scriptures how Messiah is God. You know, because often when a Jewish person is coming to believe, they'll finally say, okay, I can believe that Yeshua, that Jesus is the Messiah, but I don't believe he's God. That's, that's often kind of an in-between step on their way to coming to, to know the truth. Once we, they admit, okay, he, we, I gotta look at him as a Messiah. He was someone greater than the norm, and what he did was greater than the norm, but I still don't equate him with God because no one's equal to God. No, you're right, no one is equal to God. 
that God is equal to himself. And God shows us in our own Hebrew scriptures that he is God the Father. He is God the Son. That's why a scripture like Proverbs 30 verse 4 is great because it'll talk about, um, I think the final phrase is who collects the wind in his fist. I think it's the, the final phrase before the one I want. And obviously the answer is God. It asks several questions, who, 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 and, and the, the mind is saying, God, God, God. And then it asks, and where does this phrase name? If you can name it. Yes? Uh, the same problem is I don't know enough in there. I know they call God their God, and I put them with a little G, but they call their God Allah. And then their prophet is Muhammad. Jesus is a prophet. You know? So yes, I agree with you. Um, but he comes, you know, actually, and this is hard maybe for me to convey, but I see Satan is who they're really worshiping, and I see him use different names. He uses the name Allah. He uses a different yeah. name with a different cult, and another name with another cult, and another name with another cult. So, in essence, you see a plurality of gods with the little G. But, you know, like they think they're worshiping. Actually, when you go back in history and study the name Allah, actually boils down to being the moon god. That's what they were worshiping in the moon. The name Allah comes hmm. from that time. Now, can I show you that today? No, I'd have to go back and re-study, but I remember being taught that and shown how that came out, that, that really, they're worshiping the moon god. They're word, but that doesn't mean they're worshiping the god who created the moon, because we know the god who created the moon. Mm -hmm. But they're worshiping this one who's got their eyes on something lesser, and we know that Satan trying to grab that glory for himself. Probably about as clear as I can make it from class today. Okay. Then we will move back on. We've got the one throne. We've got the uh, singular pronoun, he is, showing they are united. And what does it say about it? The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his bond servants will serve him. So who are the bond servants? Who's serving him? Very good. Let's go back to Revelation 1, verse 6, because that's where we started. Okay, and in Revelation 1, I'm going to try it in my Jewish Bible here, see if I can get it faster. There we go. One and verse six, we have who has caused us to be a kingdom that is Kohenim, priests for God, his father, to him be the glory and the rulership forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Okay, so that's what I can tell you. It's Messiah, Yeshua, Jesus is the one who, who has made us. Because verse 5 says, to him who loves us, who has freed us from our sins at the cost of his blood. Everybody agrees that's Yeshua, Jesus. He's the one who has caused us to be a kingdom of priests. Who else are these bond servants that are going to be serving God? Well, let's stay in our book and let's go to Revelation chapter 7. Again, long enough ago, do I expect you to remember it all? No. <laughs> Revelation 7, chapter 14, chapter 7, verses 14 and 15. And we read in those verses, Sir. Well, I didn't have to get us the question from verse 13. When did the elders ask me? These people dressed in white robes, who are they? Where are they from? Verse 14, sir, I answered, you know. Okay, we've got Yohan and the angel talking back and forth. The angels asked Yohan, who's this group that are in these white robes? And where did they come from? He's wanting to make sure Yohan is understanding who all he's seeing. And, and Yohan isn't understanding. He says, you know, tell me. And he says, then he told me, these are the people who have come out of the great tribulation or out of the great persecution. They have washed their robes and made them white with the blood of the Lamb. That is why they are before God's throne. Keep reading. Day and night they serve him in his temple. The one who sits on the throne will put his Shekinah glory upon them. So these tribulation saints, the ones who came out of the great tribulation, the ones that we saw under the throne, crying out, remember asking God how long until you yeah. will... Um, avenge our blood. These are who is being talked about, and notice what they're doing day and night. Now it is not really night because remember, in the presence of the Lord, there is no night. How do you turn out the light? 
<laughs> can't. So it's just telling us continual is what that is meaning. They're continually serving him in the temple. And remember, the temple really is the new Yerushalayim. And the one who sits on the throne, we see this throne in chapter 22. He puts his glory on them. So we are going to be serving the Lord. We're serving God around his throne. And we're going to be joined by all the tribulation saints also that will be with us. So there's going to be a whole lot of us serving, worshiping, praising, singing, Hallelujah. going out to do whatever the Lord sends us out to. Yeah, pretty cool. Huh? Yeah, it's interesting the word servant here that will serve him. That word was used by the Jewish people to denote service rendered to Jehovah only by the Israelites. The way that they use the word in our Old Testament, all our original covenant scriptures, that's the word they used when they were talking about serving Jehovah. Not when they were talking about serving their fellow man, but when they were serving Jehovah, they used the root that we see in this word here. Um, look with me real quick at Hebrews, a very good book to go to when you want Jewish thinking. <laughs> and we're going to go to Hebrews chapter 9, verse 26. Hebrews chapter 9, verses 1 and 6. It tells us about the first covenant that's revealed to us in our original. The first covenant had both regulations for worship and a holy place here on earth. Told us how to worship God on earth, had a place for us to worship God on earth. Now remember, we're talking to a Jewish audience. Where did the Jewish people go to worship God? The temple. Before the temple, where did they go? Before, go back. Somebody said it. I heard this from a tabernacle. Tabernacle was the temple mobile. Okay? Once they settled, once they have the land, once they're in Jerusalem, the, the mobile goes away in the, the permanent space. Okay? So they went into the tabernacle to worship. Remember, it had the huge yard. They made sacrifice right at the start. And as he went all the way in, the high priest would go into the Holy of Holies at that time that he was supposed to. <coughs> the temple, you've got your saint, the sacrifices outside and moving in. You had your court of the Jews, you had the court of the, well, the court of the Gentiles, the court of the women, the court of the, the Jewish men. You had the area that the priests only went in and the eventual to the, where the high priest only would be. So here's what it's talking about in verse 12. Now drop down to verse 6. With things so wrenched, the, the priests go into the outer tent all the time to discharge their duties. They're always out there doing the sacrifices, doing their work, doing whatever needs to be done. But only the Kohen Hagadol, the high priest, enters. The inner one goes in only once a year, and it goes on explaining it. So this is being drawn on that. This was service. When they were doing this service, that's when this word was used. Does that mean that we're in heaven and we do sacrifices? No. Of course not, but it does show service directly to God. Not to fellow man, but service directly to Jehovah, to the Lord God himself. I don't know about you, but that excites me. To know that I get to serve him, to get to do something for him, to get to express my love in that way. Hey, I'm all for it. Um, Aren't you doing that right now? Yes, I am attempting to. I'm going to this my ability, but I know I'll really be able to do it there. And the fact that gets to do it forever. Because even though I am thankful and appreciative and I tell him so now, I still believe, and I'll put it that way, my belief, I believe when I see him and I see the nail pierced hands and the nail pierced feet, I think there's going to be another level of awe to the high cost of what he did for me. And I think it's going to humble me and I think it's going to put me on my face before him, and my heart's going to say, how can I say thank you? I think of now the best of my human ability, but I thank him that I feel that I'll have more ability in my new body to really thank him. Because right now when we serve the Lord, because we're still in the creation, sometimes we don't know if our heart is really out of Or even just out of habit. Or just yeah, out of habit. Yeah. I tell the Lord every time I'm, in, that I'm going into our time of service, touch me in my heart, God. Let this be between you and me. 
I don't want to be just because, okay, not for me because we're reaching church people, I'm talking about Saturdays. Saturday or Sunday, okay? I'm not here to, to say one day's right and one day's wrong. I'm here to say there's a day to serve the Lord, serve Him. So apply it however you do. But if you go regularly on Sunday, if you go regularly on Saturday, it is very easy to walk in with your mind on a million other things and just start going through what you're going through. And an hour, hour and a half later, two hours later, whatever it is, you walk out the door and have you really plugged in with the Lord? Did you really separate? Did you do what God made the Shabbat for, the Sabbath for? Separate. Put all your stuff aside. Focus just on me. And, and I ask him, touch my heart. You know, let me feel it. Let me forget everybody's around me. Let me in, in the singing. Let me because I can't carry a tune. I don't have the joy of you who are, who are musical. But the words can touch me that way. Let it touch me. Let me fill you fresh and anew. And then let me pour out in that service to you, especially if I'm the one having an opportunity to teach that day. Get me out of the way, Lord. Let me just be your vehicle. And I'll tell you, there are times when I literally stand outside of myself and watch myself going, go, Lord, go, Lord, go, Lord. It's awesome. I love it. I want to be that way all the time. Well, when I get to this point, I'm going to be that way all the time and even better than I am now. That's what I'm trying to say. Because as much as I do want to love him in my fullest capacity, like Rowena said, sometimes, plus sometimes there is just sin in the way. Sin that we're not even aware of. We may get convicted halfway through that service, Lord whispering something and say, there, you know, a little tension here, please. <laughs> you know, and I want that. I want to be tender. I cry out with the psalmist, W. Search my heart, O oh God, and see if there be any wicked way in me. And am I putting myself up as an example? Please no. Please no. I am exactly like you guys. I am not anything to put on any pedestal. All of you from the pedestal is fall. And no thank you. I have no need to fall and have some problems because of that. So please realize what I'm saying is the same with all of you. We are all equal. We are equal in God's sight. He does not see me as any better or anything else. The only difference when I am teaching, I am held to a higher responsibility. Remember those Hebrew national commercials? They don't put in the fillers because they have to answer to a higher authority. <laughs> I better not put in any fillers into the Word of God because I have to answer to a higher authority. So, yes, I'm given that privilege of being a teacher, but it doesn't put me on a pedestal, and I am held to a higher yeah. responsibility there where I had better be on my knees. And you hear my prayer, and I let you hear it on purpose. Lord God, I'm not teaching here today. Let me get out of the way and let the Holy Spirit be the one who teaches. And that's why even though I have notes, I'm not going verbatim. I'm not scripted. I want the Holy Spirit to speak. And I can tell you honestly, too, there are times when I've got up, gotten up to teach, not a Bible book like this, but I've gotten up with the intent that this is what I'm going to teach today. And the Holy Spirit's taken it and goes in a whole different direction. And every time that happens, there's at least one in that audience who will say, that was exactly what I needed. Today. Now, did I do that? No. Did I know that? No. Could I orchestrate that? No. But my heart will rejoice and say, thank you, Lord. I was out of the way, and look what you did, and give him all the glory. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm talking about is, is that connection. And I want that connection. I'm selfish. I want that 24-7. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I want that. I don't get it, but I want it. And one day, I will get it. One day it will happen. And the beautiful thing is, every single face I'm looking at has the same thing with me. And I get it 24-7. You all are going to have it 24-7 too. So <laughs> we're all going to have it together. And, and believe me, the moment I'm going down in that, you know, that, that part that's so thankful, I also see the next moment and why I love that song. And the next moment, I'm up, hallelujah! <laughs> yes, I think we're going to do both. We're going to fall on our faces and we're going to jump for joy and shout the hallelujah. So that's what I want to bring out here. I want us so excited over our future because you know what? We can be in heaven before this day ends. It is that 
imminent. So, are you ready? Yes. If you've got your eyes on this world and you're thinking, oh no, but, oh no, but, that's your idols. That's what you need to get out of the way. I want to be ready. I want to go. <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't need any help. Eric, yeah, you have it for a while. <laughs> Did you forget? I'm sorry. No, yeah, I have a question. Yes, I'm all this line. Um, I, I, I know that God knows what is the work of the Holy Spirit, the good works, and the works that is carnal. Mm -hmm. And it reminds me of when we're raptured over there that we will have the Bema seat which would then, God will determine through the fire, which is the good works, right? Which so works it's in already our flesh and in ourselves, right. and which works yeah. the So there's nothing to worry about, no. It's just, we are believers, and we still have that training in righteousness, you know, being established, and as you go along into the fullness of righteousness. Right, right, and we are on that, we're in that training. We're sacrificing ourselves daily, as Rachel Paul says in Romans 12, putting ourselves down on the altar as a living sacrifice, Amen. holy and acceptable unto God, so that he can be changing us and conforming us into his image, which means if I'm the same place today that I was a year ago in my spiritual walk, shame on me. Something is wrong there. Because if God really has carte blanche in my life, he's going to be growing me up in him. And I should be able to, as I judge myself, to be right before my God, I should be able to look back and say, okay, I can see growth. Now, I don't know about you, and I hate to say it, because you might not like to hear it, but the greatest times of growth come where? Come where you through the adversity, through the trial, and through the storm. So as much as I hate those words to come out of my mouth because I'm warning you, that's why God allows it in our lives, okay? Naomi went into the fire. Forgive me for not even giving you a chance to say, don't use my name, but I'm using you. She gave six months sacrificially of her life with her sister, who she loved. To her, I'm sure she's saying, no, it wasn't a sacrifice, Rochelle. You know, this is what I was supposed to do. But she went through trial and tribulation that she admitted in her human frailty reaching out to those who were there spiritually holding her up. She admitted at times, pray for me. I need help. I, you know, this is almost more than I can bear. You know, she's watching her sister die. That's not easy. She's dealing with all the physical. That's not easy. She's dealing with her own physical getting tired. That's not easy. Forgive me. I hope I'm not being too personal here. <laughs> but I saw her growth, and that's what I want to point out. She's not the same Naomi today that she was six months before. I see what came. I saw the way the Lord held her up when we all would have said, this is more than I can do, Lord, and we all would have felt like we were crumbling. And yet, because she hung in there, she kept allowing the Lord to work, he did bring her through. She did come through victorious. She will see her sister again. And she's had an opportunity to continue to share because of what she went through. Now, if she was given the choice in her humanness, Naomi, this is what you're going to go through, what would you have said? <laughs> like, you like said six months? I don't have that much time. Yeah, <laughs> let, let me run a fair direction, like, like Yona. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I can't do it. No, yeah. I said, I said it is. It is a good thing he does not let us see too far into the future. Yeah. Because Amen. we that. might fault to take the next step that he wants us to take. Right. right. And I think he did lovingly keep from you the knowledge of all and the length so that you would go. But I knew it was no surprise to him. He knew, no. <coughs> he knew how long it was going to take mm -hmm. for them to see anything. Right, question. right, right, and sometimes that can't come as fast as we want it to. Yeah. But, uh, and for all of you, wherever you are, if you're in that trial right now, that's why I'm taking this moment of time out because I think it was Greg Laurie, one of the, the pastors that we would appreciate said, in the Christian life, you are either going into the trial 
in the chart or coming out of the chart. <laughs> so I know I got an audience here wide enough. I got people going in, I got people in, and I got people that are finally coming out going, <sighs> but do take that time when you're on that end and look back and see because you should be able to see growth in yourself and that should encourage you. Not for any of us ever to get puffed up. You know, we're not, believe me, I don't have a chance to get puffed up because in the next moment I'll do something so <laughs> disgusting that, you know, it's like, Rochelle, come on. But, but I do thank the Lord. I see growth in myself also. And I want you all come along that with me. You don't want to allow Satan to put you down. Oh, you're worthless. You're no good. You can't do anything. So you become so discouraged. You're not a good servant for the Lord. He will so discourage me in you in a heartbeat. That's one of his favorite tools. He uses that, I think, worldwide. I think there's hardly a person that that tool doesn't do damage on at times. And that's why I will say this. And I'll go over this long and hard at this moment in time. Again, unscripted and unplanned. So if I'm speaking to you, you're the one who can come up to me after class and say, you know what? Yeah, I'm the one that needed that today. And I have a feeling that class of size there's going to be more of one. Because <laughs> we all, we need that. We need that encouragement. But realize, if you are in that trial, it's not worthless. And the Lord is not unaware. He sees your frailty. He saw in the only wearing. He knows that those of us who are watching on the outside were praying, Lord, you know, you've got to supernaturally carry her because physically she's spent. And we saw the Lord keep her going there in the end until his perfect timing when he took her. Verses so And even a little after that, because he didn't, he didn't just all end in a day, did it? Yeah. <laughs> but that's why you heard even me praying for refreshing even still today. Even down to the region, I'll just be with questions. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Mm -hmm. Problems. Mm -hmm. And even, yeah, may the testimony go forth because my prayer is Grace will see every one of her children in heaven one day with her. And that will be partly because of you, partly because of her, and always because of our God. Okay, okay did I see a hand or are we ready to move on? Eric. Yeah, I'm just going to say that uh, in my daily prayers, one of my favorite verses is uh, Luke 6, 40, where it says that uh, no disciple is above the teacher, but with perfect training, we could be like him. So I pray that every day, Lord, give me that perfect training. I, I want to be like your son so bad, you know. And then, and somehow he'll tell me, like, in the morning, like, the things that are wrong with me, and I go, oh my gosh, I can't believe that I'm that away, you know? Mm -hmm. But I appreciate the fact that he shows me these things because in order for me to be like his son, then things are not acceptable because he wasn't mm -hmm. that away. But I, I just want right. to bring that and up. And just like we all did with our children as they're growing up, we help guide them so that they'll become good adults. We don't just let them do whatever and be whatever we teach them. This is how to be. This is the right way to be. I saw a young mom with a young son point out something that happened that we all around had seen, and it was not a good scene. And I heard her quietly say to her son, you don't be like that when you're an adult. That's not the right way to treat others, da da da. You know, she went on. But how rare to see the day out in the open like that where a mom's trying to train up her child to be a good, a good citizen, a good person. Well, yes, in the same way. That's what the Lord's doing with us. And I love the fact that he's patient with us. Oh, because yeah. I need to learn it over and over and over. I need that repetitious learning. And I need, yeah. you know, and, and as I grow, then I do see, oh, okay, that's not pleasing the Lord. That didn't bother me a year ago. Boy, it bothers me today. Because I've grown. Because the Lord can reveal more. And that's why Shaul Paul, who to me is a great example, even said, is daily crucifying yourself. Amen. Daily laying yourself down. Daily saying, Lord, you know, be alive in me. So, let's continue on. We, I want to take you real quickly to Psalm 46.4 because we're talking about the tabernacle. We're talking about the, the, uh, the, the temple. We're talking about the new Yerushalayim, the new heaven being all that. Well, Psalm 46, I think, gives us a beautiful picture. Um, again, I can see some of it maybe at millennial time, but definitely it comes to the point of being eternity future. 
We've got uh, in the beginning that God is our refuge and strength. That's why it's obviously prior to eternity, future time. But notice verse, uh, okay, we're going to go verse 4. If you're in the complete Jewish Bible, you have to look at verse 5. There is a river. Okay, remember the river? So I think we're on the same talk here. There's a river whose streams gladden the city of God. Are we not talking about the city of God? So I think we're catching that this has gone beyond where it started now to a greater place. The holy habitation of El Yon, that's the Most High God, God is in the city. And then it's brought back down to where we're at today. I will not be moved. When daybreak comes, God will help. Okay? So your version might be a little different, but I think that little glimpse, a city whose rivers, the streams gladden the city of God. Remember the river? Remember how beautiful it is? Remember it reflecting? Does that not bring joy? I think we're seeing a sneak peek. Smaller level, as, as they looked at the tabernacle and temple, smaller level on what we see during the millennial when the Shekinah glory fills that temple, greater when we hit eternity future, when the whole New Yerushalayim is the temple. Because the whole place is the place of worship to God. It is where we're one with our God. And with them. Okay. Oh, by the way, too, the term, the tense back here in Revelation um, for serving is continually. We will continually serve. It's not a serve once and stop. It is continual. Okay, serving. We have to put the ing on it in our English. No idleness in heaven. No laziness. No. Let's go park it. And let's you know. We'll put our feet up. You know, an umbrella over us, a drink in our hands, and we're like at the beach. <laughs> it's not a party that way. It's even. That's nothing compared to this, because again, this city of God, this new Jerusalem that, that I'm trying to describe to us, in essence, is the tabernacle of God, I think I have said that, where his presence dwells, so the whole city answers as the tabernacle, or as the temple, it, it's, it's been brought up to that, that next level. Remember also, that was the place of fellowship, that was when, when Moshe would even go in, and they would wait for him to come out, He'd be in fellowship with his God in, in there. So it's a place of fellowship. We know that the showbread that was used in the tabernacle, in the temple, spoke to, it was symbolic of the fellowship with our God. So it's not just, it's more than just in his presence. We're in, we're in his very fellowship. There's a, a camaraderie that's in there that is more than just, okay, he's in the room. You know, it's more than that, and that's what I'm trying to bring out now is that level also. The Messiah we know is the light of it. We know that, that we've already talked about how there's no other light. But remember, everything on earth, the veil had to be over Moshe's face. The veil had to be over the Holy of Holies. When the high priest went into the Holy of Holies, they had to go in with the incense so that the smoke would, would keep the, the glory from blinding him. Now all of that's gone. We're in the midst of that glory. We're in the midst of that presence. We're in that fellowship. And that takes me again all the way back to the beginning because that's how God created us. And again, when I get into that end up and we go through that, it's, it's very hard to communicate some of these things. I just have to hope that you can grasp it as much as I can because I can't fully grasp and it's hard to teach what you can't fully grasp. But when I get into the Hebrew root of the meanings, you see that God put innately into man this ability to fellowship with himself because he hungered for the fellowship of his creation. That's why he made us. This is the culmination for him also. He's had to wait all these thousands of years that God for his long suffering and his patience that he didn't just at any point say, you know what, they're not worth it, I'll wipe them out and I'll do it all over again in a different way. But he finally sees his creation brought in into that relationship with him, will finally really be able to fellowship with him. Hallelujah. Can you imagine that? I, yeah. I'm not worried. Yeah. I, I told you when I started studying with this, I, I tell you how brilliant it was in my prayer. was, oh, God, don't want me to sound like a fool in his presence. <laughs> well, now let's take that to the level with God. When I realize how 
awesome, ineffable, you know, my favorite word, how great, how majestic is our God. The thought that I could fellowship with him, the thought that I could be worthy of being in his presence, and him welcoming me in that intimately and that closely, that personally. I'm, I'm just feeling like it's um, the word that I'd like to use is oneness. Yes, it is a oneness. So like, like Jesus said, <coughs> I, my father and I are one. Yes. So are we. Yes. And he gave that example in marriage of the man and the woman clinging together, the two becoming one. They're, they're to be one. They're not to be separated again. Divorce was never in God's book. And if you're here a victim of divorce or use a different word, but can I do with divorce? I'm not here to point a finger at you. It's not what I'm talking about. But God's original plan was that oneness. Yes. Yes, absolutely. And we're finally seeing it. Finally. No veil. No smoke screen. Nothing having to separate. Not God having to be patient. I, I, again, I see the, the, the father-child relationship all the time. And I think how patient a father has to be with that little three-year-old. You know, they're not on their level. But because they love them, they are patient with them. Hopefully, for being a good father. Our father is. And I keep feeling like I'm that three-year-old. And it's like, I want to be the adult with you, Lord. I want to grow up. <laughs> grow me up, Lord. And then I realize, oh, oh, watch my own words because I've just asked for another trial. <laughs> That's so, even so, Lord. Bring it on and bring me through because he never, never abandons, never forsakes, and he never lack. He gives you all you need. He is Jehovah Yura, the Lord, our provider. And then the beautiful part, the dwelling with him in this presence that we're talking about forever. That's my next favorite word right now. Ineffable God and forever. <laughs> yes. Good way to put it. Exchanging imagination for reality, yes, because we are only imagining. We are only trying to grasp, and yet it's going to be our reality. And in that reality, look at verse 4, if you're not close, <laughs> they will see his face. They'll see him. Immediate access into the God of glory. And not wondering, seeing him. Face to face. I think I brought out to you before, Ben and Crosby wrote many, many, many of the beautiful hymns that people still love today. She was blind from birth, never saw, never knew the beauties this world holds. And somebody said to her one day, you know, don't you feel cheated? Don't you wish that you'd gotten to see for a time? You know, they were feeling sorry for her. And in her jargon, ah, no, honey, the first thing I'm going to see when I see is my Jesus' face. And she felt the most blessed. I don't have to see all this first and Jesus second. I see him first. She had it right. She had it right. We will see him face to face. That's what was withheld from Moshe when he even wanted it. God, show me you. I want to see you. This one who was in a good relationship when he asked God, who wasn't in rebellion, who God was using as a great leader, leading his people, leading them to the promised land, God's nature plan here. It's not anything that you can fault Moshe in, but God had to say, no, you can't, Moshe. You can't see me and live. It's too great, but he wanted it so badly. I love God. <laughs> Let me find a way to appease you. I'll put you in the cleft of the rock. I'll pass by, and I'll just let you see what's left behind. And even in that afterglow, it was enough that it made no shade glow. And I think it satisfied him for a time. And yet, we're not going to be put in the cleft, and it's not going to pass by, and it's not going to be what remains behind. Face to face, I cannot imagine seeing his face. I cannot imagine. I don't know about you, but I've never seen a painting that I'm satisfied with. <laughs> and my imagination doesn't satisfy me either. 
Okay, we talked earlier about how hot it was outside, how glad we are that we're not going to a teacher that's hotter. But how many would like to warm up a little right now? If you would that, please. I'm the point that I've got ready for my teeth to chapter, so I thought there's got to be some others that are feeling it a little bit. Just don't fry us, please. But they will see his face. And even more than that, his name will be on their foreheads. Okay? Uh, Oh, I skipped a couple of things so I was going to bring out. <laughs> the pure in heart, let me, let me summarize because I'm watching time. I've been too wordy again. Matthew chapter 5, verse 8. That's the chapter of the Beatitudes. Sometimes we need to do a study of Beatitudes with a Jewish mind. It's very interesting. This is the kingdom of God that's been promised to the Jewish nation in right fellowship with him that we see a glimpse of in the millennium. But when you see this, you begin to understand those Beatitudes through a different set of eyes also. And it's the pure in heart that are promised to see his face. Yes. Do we get it? Mm -hmm. Pure in heart then when we get to see his face. And it's promised to the righteous also. We see that in Psalm in Tehillim. Matthew 5 8. It is in your cross references. Yes. Uh, Psalm 17 15 tells us that it's promised to the righteous. And Hebrews 12 14. I'm in Psalms, so I'll go Psalm real quick, and we'll see how fast maybe we'll do both of those. Psalm 17 and verse 15. Psalm 17, 15 says, But my prayer in righteousness is to see your face. On waking, may I be satisfied with the vision of you. That's what the psalmist cried out for. That's what we will receive. We'll go ahead and do real quick. Hebrews 12. If you can't get there in time, I'll read it. You don't have to look it up. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 14. Hebrews 12 and verse 14 says, okay, here we go. Keep pursuing shalom, keep pursuing peace with everyone and the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. If you're not living holy and the only way you live holy is through the shed blood of Yeshua Jesus in your life, your death, he's alive, and pursuing peace and that is his shalom, that's how you will see yeah, in all his glory. You won't see the Lord if you're not living like that, because if you're not living like that, you're not his child. If you are his child, he's going to be bringing you in that relationship all along. Okay, so we see it in many places promised us what a glory that will be. And even like the, the song Stuart Hamlin, his hymn, the things of earth will grow strangely dim by the, how does it say, by the, the glory of his face? The, is it glory of his face? Okay. All of a sudden, I was worried about the one word, yes. And, and I agree. Again, I, I think everything here is self going to pale in comparison. Whatever we've held most treasured here is just going to be nothing compared to his face. And when you're discouraged now wondering, can you make it? Look for his face. Because remember when Kepa Peter stepped out on the water? He stood on the water. He walked on the water. He was doing it. He was fine. But he was looking at Yeshua. And then he made the fatal mistake. And he looked at the waves. That was his problem. If he kept his eyes totally on Yeshua and didn't look around, he would have made it all the way to Yeshua. So keep your eyes looking on Yeshua Jesus. Yes. Okay, and his name will be on their foreheads. That we saw promised to which church? Do you remember Revelation chapter 3? Do you remember which church? Oops. Very good. Very good. I thought, especially when you're in chapter 3, it should have you. There we go. My tablet's finally going to let me. Revelation 3 and verse 12. Revelation 3 and verse 12 are in the church of Philadelphia. This is the on fire serving the Lord missionary church, the one that is uh, exemplified, the one that, that the Lord does not take the task in. And he says to he who overcomes, that means we're fitting right in there. You cannot look at trials and say, oh, then, then I'm not in the right church and I'm not the right people. I wouldn't have trials if so. No. No, there can be trials that we bring on ourselves, that we do suffer the consequences of our choices, and we, we pay for it. But very often for believers, the trial is not for correction, it's for growth. And it's in that that we see here that it says, he who overcomes, he's brought you into that, you overcome how? Well, how do we overcome? 
First John 5, 4 and 5, how do we overcome? By faith. By faith. Thank you, Tony. By faith. Okay, so he who overcomes, by faith. I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. Where's that temple? We've just seen it. That's the new Yerushalayim, not the little, not just this that hovered over, but this on steroids. <laughs> That's filling all of the new heavens. Well, I can't say all the new heavens, but I mean, it, it's, it's our home in the new heavens. We're in that temple. We're in his glory. We're seeing it there. We're a pillar in that temple, and he will no, not go out from it anymore. That's our home base. We're home. Even when he sends you out, you're not going out from it because you're going in his presence. His presence is fully filling all of the heavens, so you won't feel like you're leaving him ever. I can't imagine. I cannot imagine. I still think one of the, the, the people I feel the most sorry for in Scripture is Lazarus. Four days in the glory that was at that time in the heart of the earth, but four days in it. And then he was brought back. <laughs> I think he had words with his sisters after the Lord left. Yeah, I could be wrong, but I just keep, I don't, I'm not coming down to people. <laughs> <It's not God. laughs> but here's, here's the airport. And I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God. What city? The New Jerusalem. Am I making this up? No. Is that right there in Scripture? Yeah. Yes. Do you want a verse to prove? Yes. Revelation 3.12, which comes down out of heaven from my God and my new name. Remember, he gives us each a new name. Yes. Wow, Tony. <laughs> that means between you and the Lord. I don't know if others are going to hear it or not, but when he calls you by your new name, you know you're this. And I believe that, that it's marked on our foreheads because we see that with how he, the, the 144,000 were marked. We see it by Satan's counterfeit. You know, he puts the mark on the, the forehead. I believe that's showing you belong to. Here we would call it, um, what do you do to sheep? Brand 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 I think it, it, here we, we call it branding, we see it as something less than beautiful, but if I can have a name that's between the Lord and me, brand it on me, oh, bring it on, Lord, <laughs> bring it on. And just knowing that when people even look at me, they'll see this glorious name that I belong to the Lord. I'm his, I'm fully his. Which song, uh, may I ask Yes, you may add. Um, that would be an indication that when you pray, look to reach out to someone, the Lord, let the person see Jesus in me. Yes. Yes. Let the Lord see Jesus in me. That's the branding. Let him see that branding. Let them let them see it now dimly, there in all its glory. Yes. Yes. So um, we belong to him and he's publicly acknowledging it. You know, when we say something belongs to us and we put their name on it, I think again of the marriage. It's a little different now in today's day and age, but it was, you know, for, for a long time, it was that the woman took the man's name. She belonged to him. And not in the sense that, oh, now she's his slave. No, but he was proud to put his name on her. She was proud to take her name from him. That, I think, is a little sample of this relationship, this oneness again that earlier was, was bringing out earlier. We're one with him, so we wear his name. He gives us a special new name, intimate again between us and the Lord. We are so blessed tonight. <laughs> Sorry, but I want to go, I want to go, I want to go. <laughs> I'm a little kid, I want to go now, Lord. <laughs> Revelation 22, and we're, I think, ready for verse 5. I think we are. Do we finish four? Yes, on the fourth. We finish. Okay, in verse five again, there will no longer be any night. We've talked about that. There cannot be any darkness in the presence of Yeshua. It just, it literally says there shall be night no more, or night there will be no more. It's hard to, to bring it exactly, but again, the Lord is illuminating. He is the illumination. He is the lamp. He is the light. Um, let me take you to Isaiah again, Yeshua, chapter 60 and verse 9. Isaiah was full talking about the light. The people who walked in darkness would see a great light. And we know that was the nation of Israel. And the light that came was Yeshua himself. Chapter 60, verse 1. Arise, shine, Yerushalayim, for your light has come. 
the glory of Adonai has risen over you. We're constantly reminded of that. Down in verse 19 of that chapter where I just quoted that verse. Chapter 19, I'm mean, sorry, verse 19, chapter 60 says, No more will the sun be your light by day, no, nor will moonlight shine on you. Instead, Adonai will be your light forever, and your God, your glory. Again, this is just telling us how much he is going to eliminate. Jehovah is, is light. I say Jehovah because I'm talking God. God is light. We know Yeshua, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. We know he is light. We know that, that the Shekinah glory is light. All of this is, is you know, it's all one. Um, again, Revelation 21, 23. Let's go back there because we are so close to that. We were just studying it. Revelation 21 and verse 23 says, The city has no need for the sun or the moon to shine on it because God's Shekinah glory gives it light and its lamp is the lamp. That's what we've still got, this new Jerusalem. You can't bring dark into that. You know, light dispels the dark. Dark is gone the minute, the second, the split second you turn on that light, dark's gone. It flees. It can't stay in light. And that's what we're seeing. It's, it's, and again, we're seeing Yeshua and Jehovah both are the light because it talks about God is the light. God Shekinah gives it the light. The lamp is the lamb. How do I separate that? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I, I can't. It's just always light in the presence of our holy God. And again, I'm seeing God is the Father and God is the Son, and they are both light. Both. There, there just is no darkness. So there is no night in it. Uh, I went back to chapter 21. Let me get back here. Okay, 22. Yeah, 22 and verse 5 again. Sorry, it's going to have a minute. Okay, so we have no need of the light of uh, the lamp, nor the light of the sun, because the Lord God will illumine them. And notice the Lord God, Adonai, Jehovah, Lord and God. I see both again here will illumine them. They will reign forever and ever. How long is forever and ever? No more electric No more electric bills. No more electric bills. No more electric bills. No cause. No more power failures. No, nothing. And reigning forever. And remember what we were called just a little bit earlier? Where where was it? Um, verse 3, was it? Where we saw that we're his sponsors. Yes. You know, we talked about how we're kingdom of priests. The priests are serving. Here we've got him reigning. If he's reigning, we're serving forever and ever and ever. Okay? So, this part, just stopping here and just summarizing what we have, the blessings and the graciousness that's been provided for us, for the saints, we see no more curse. That is perfect restoration. No more curse. We see the throne of God in it. That is perfect administration. No oops, no judgments not fair, perfect administration. The servant shall serve. That's perfect subordination. You don't find one rebellious spirit here. There's not one that's going to say my way. There's not one that's going to lift up and say no worship me. No, none of that enters. We see his face and that's the perfect transformation. Perfect transformation. We see the names on our foreheads, perfect identification. You ever use your wallet? <coughs> you have to prove who you are. And then we see God the light, the perfect illumination, and we see reigning forever, perfect exaltation. No more Nope. Nope. And he is exalted forever. Now, verse 6 brings us back to Yochanan's day. So, okay, we got to come back down just a little bit. We know what's coming. We can hardly wait. If God told us more, I don't know that we could wait. <laughs> I'm just excited now. I feel like that little kid is counting down the days. And I am counting. And every day it can be, this is day zero. Every day. We'll see that as we go on. Verse 6 tells us, and he said to me, again, this is the angel that's been talking to Yochanan, that's been showing Yochanan all that's been going on since the, at the beginning, I think it was, of chapter 21. It's definitely by verse 9 or 21, but it may have been before. Anyway, he said to me, these words are faithful and true. 
he is giving that assurance, okay? He is telling Yochanan, trust it. It is trustworthy. None of us want to buy the bill of goods. Something's too good to be true. And what I'm telling you has got to sound to the unsaved like that's too good to be true. But to those of us who belong, he gives us the faith to believe. And this is not the one that's too good to be true. This is the one that is trustworthy. In, and I think that's why the angel is reassuring the Yohan. I imagine he's just like, really, really? This is what we're going to have. Remember, he is on the Isle of Patmos as a prisoner. He is in a suffering state in his physical body. He's old and he's worn and he's tired and he's seeing the glory of, of the Lord, the glory of God. He's seeing our heavenly home. You can just imagine, it's like, it's, it's gonna burst. It's too good to be true. And the angel's like, no, no, this, is trustworthy. You can trust it. You can stake your life on it, Yohanan. You have and you'll be rewarded for it. Nothing's going to pull this out from under you. This is trustworthy. I love the reassurance. And then he goes on and he says, And the Lord, the God of the spirits of the prophets, sent his angel to show his bondservants the things which must soon take place. Okay, let's break that down. The Lord... God of the prophets, okay, or the spirits of the prophets is how it, this, this version says. The Lord God of the prophets, who is that? Who's the God of the prophets? The Lord God of the prophets. Okay, when we talk about the spirit, you're going to say Holy Spirit, but we're talking about the Lord, or we're talking about God, right? Who, who's, who are the prophets pointing us to? Who, yes, yes, their picture of Yeshua Jesus, he is the spirit of prophecy. Prophecy spoke of him, of his first coming. It speaks of his second coming. So when it's talking about the, the holy prophets, those who have not the false prophets, the holy prophets, the Lord God and the holy prophets, that's our Lord and Savior, that's God the Father, and yes, through the Spirit is how it's revealed to us. Okay, so the Lord, the God of, of the Spirit of that prophet, that prophet didn't come up with those words on their own. They didn't. They weren't just brilliant and they came up with something. No, the Spirit of God revealed to them prophecy. They spoke and it did happen. That was the proof that what they were saying was true. If it didn't happen, take them out and stone them. They are you put to death because they are a false prophet. That's a heavy sentence. Okay? But they had the spirit of the Lord God, so what they spoke was true, and that is is the source of what we have here also because Really, a lot of this book has been prophecy. It's been prophesied of the glory of the Messiah. Remember, what's our first four words? The revelation of Yeshua HaMashiach. The revelation, the revealing of Jesus the Messiah. That's what a lot of this book has been about. All of the scriptures, the prophets have been speaking. When the prophets quit speaking, it was because God spoke in his son. In the last days, Hebrews tells us, Hebrews 1 tells us that he spoke through his son. His son completed the whole picture. We're carrying this all the way through and we are seeing faithful and true, trustworthy, no lie, no false, no pretense, no too good to be true, no half truth, fully truth and truth only. And the Lord, the God who put the, the, that into the prophets, sent his angel to show his bondservants. Remember, we're his bondservants. So he sent his angel to show his bondservants the things which much, must soon take place. Well, that takes us right back to the beginning, doesn't it? Right back to Revelation in the beginning. In fact, go with me a little bit. Revelation 1. <clears throat> Revelation chapter 1. And we read right in the beginning. The Revelation of Yeshua, Hamashiach, the Revelation of Jesus Christ. Next phrase, which God gave him to show to his bond servants the things which must soon take place. And he sent and communicated it by his angel to his bond servant, Yochanan, John. So we know God's sending the message. He's going through the Son. In essence, the Son is sending the message too. We're going to see that in just a moment. And it's coming down, communicated by an angel to his bond servant, Yochanan. And we're told in the end, this is to be brought to the bond servants, for the bond servants to know the things that are going to take place. So it's all tied together. What's interesting is that you see here, it talks about, in chapter 1, it talks about God sending it. 
God's initiator, sending it. Now go back to chapter 22. And in chapter 22, where are we in? Six. Chapter 22 and verse 6, we have um, the words are faithful and true, and the Lord, the God of the spirits. We have all denied it. Again, what are we seeing? Chapter 1 says, God sent the angel to tell the bond servants. And chapter 22 says, the Lord, in essence, who you'd say Yeshua Jesus, sent to tell the, the, the bond servants. Now, do we have a conflict? No. No, because there are one. Remember, we saw two sitting on the throne, but the throne is his throne. We see that oneness again. So God the Father and God the Son both sent the angel to reveal and spoke to the prophets through the Spirit to give to us the things which must come. Isn't that cool? I love it. I love that it all comes together. <laughs> okay, so, uh, and we haven't even taken a sneak peek. Remember how I love to cheat and look at the end? <laughs> look at verse 16. I, Yeshua Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things. Doesn't get more specific than that there, does it? So Jesus is saying in 22.16, he sent. And God is saying in chapter 1, verse 1, that he sent, because he even says he sent through his son, which means it has to be God sending. And then his son sent. You can't get more clear than it again. Which is which? It's a coming together again. It reminds me in a very small way because it's not putting it on the level of God. But my father grew up in Orthodox Judaism and came to believe in Yeshua Jesus and took on title of pastor in his life, um, a reverend. Um, you know, he, he, I think I saw him, okay. He witnesses to Rabbi Maurice Levy who was given the title rabbi because he went through the rabbinical training that my dad did not complete. He was being trained to be a great rabbi, but he did not complete it, so he wouldn't take the title rabbi. But he took the title pastor or reverend. And Rabbi Maurice, when he got saved, was a rabbi. He didn't take the title pastor because he didn't go through the pastoral training. But the two of them did do ministry together. And one went home to heaven, finally the other one went home to heaven, and when the second one went home to heaven, my brother, and I love the way he said it, said, hmm, the preacher and the rabbi, they're back together again. Which one's which? <laughs> <laughs> and I loved it, because was he calling Maurice, the rabbi, the preacher, or the rabbi? And was he calling my dad, the preacher, or the rabbi? They could have been interchanged. Just a small little example of what we've got up here. Which one's which? Are you saying God or are you saying Yeshua? Do they have a problem with which one? No. <laughs> There's no jealousy. There's equality. Mm -hmm. They're so great. Mm -hmm. Awesome, 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 awesome. Okay, back up to verse 6. Um, to show what has to be done, what has to take place, what's going to come to pass. That's the purpose of this book. Revealing. Revelation. Remember, it's not concealing, it's uncovering, it's taking the blanket off, it's taking a look at it. It was to be revealed. And it says that it's to be done shortly or soon. What did we have? I've got to go back up. Am I I'm in 22? Okay. Uh, which must soon take place in this uh, version that I'm using. Yeah, when he, uh, we want to believe that when he says he's coming soon or speedily, we want to think it's hour, day, or month, or year, but it's not. It's events on top of, rapidly series of events on top of When it other. says that these things are taking place quickly in the book of Revelation, yes, that's a one on top of the right, other. Right. But when it says that these events will soon come to pass, that soon does mean in time. It means it's the next thing on the agenda. What are we waiting for? We're waiting for those who believe it to be pre- Trip rapture, we're waiting for the rapture to catch us up in the tribulation to start. That's the next thing on the agenda, and that's what's being told here. Now, you'll say, okay, but he wrote that to Yochanan in 95 AD, and we're in 2019 AD. We've got, you know, almost 2,000 years. How can that be fast? Well, remember to God, a day is a thousand years, a thousand years is a day. When you're looking at eternity, when you're looking at from eternity past to eternity future, now, what is 2,000 years? Is it a drop in the bucket? Yeah. Is it that ocean that somebody took a teacup and filled it up and pulled out and said, here's the ocean? <laughs> yes. So in God's eternality, 
it is soon. It is quickly coming. For us in our humanness, it feels frustrating like it's not happening. But one day it will, and it could be today. That's why the only thing I'll say different about what you say, Pam, is it can literally start today. There is nothing that has to be fulfilled before the Lord can return for us that has not been fulfilled. Everything else is the future. So we are just sitting there waiting for that that moment. It's the pregnant woman. She's in her ninth month. Okay, Lord, it's been nine months and a day. It's been nine months and two days. It's been nine months and three days. But you know the one thing I guarantee you? You don't hear her saying, okay, Lord, it's the 10th month, it's the 11th month, it's the year. No, she always does finally give birth, doesn't she? Well, guess what? This is the pregnancy, and the delivery will be, okay? It really is imminent, and that's the word that we should use, imminent. It can happen right now. Now, if it doesn't happen today, I'm not a liar. It could have happened today. It will happen in God's perfect timing, but he's letting us know this is the next event on his calendar. There's not all this other to take place first. If our Jewish people had understood all of this, they would have known when he came his first time that his offer of the kingdom was not going to happen. They would have known it's way down the line. But remember, God didn't reveal that to them. He kept that part from them. They didn't even see and understand what we call our church age here. They just saw the plan according to Israel because God wanted it to be a fair offer of the kingdom to them. And had they accepted, God had a plan that would have gone right into motion, but God knew they wouldn't, so he had a greater plan already prepared. God in his ineffable mind is... He, he, he didn't plan and then, uh-oh, now I've got to throw this in here and I've got to do this here and I've got to change that there to make it work. No, all the way back here, God had it all mapped out the way we see it. But it was concealed. We're going to go to Daniel. Um, we aren't quite there, but we're going to go look at Daniel. We can do it right now. I know it's Daniel 12, so I can think of it, but I want to see. Okay, we're going to go to Daniel 8. Also, it's in verse 10. Let me get you that. Let me get you that. We'll go to Daniel in just a moment. But I'm going to show you in Daniel it was concealed. In Revelation, he tells us it's here. It's open. Reveal it. Okay? But let's let's get there because I think I can do it that quickly. Are you getting too warm? Yeah, a okay, a little bit of air, please. <laughs> it won't be perfect till we're home, people. <laughs> okay. Um, so, and by the way, when the action does start, it is sudden. That's the idea given from the Greek wording. It will be a sudden action. Well, that fits with what we're saying also. And it can be fulfilled at any moment. So, knowing all that. Yeah, well, we'll go to Daniel shortly. We're going to need to go to chapter 8 and chapter 12. So if you've got your hand in Daniel, just put a marker there. But right now, I want us to focus on verse 7 real quick first. 7 starts with, are you ready? Where are you? Revelation 22, 7. Go back to 7, okay? Behold! <laughs> now, how many times in Revelation? 33. 33, I think if I remember right. 30 or 33, okay? There's... There, I think it's 30 because there's 33 descriptions of Messiah. Oh, yeah, that's right. So 30 times. He's saying, wake up. Pay attention. Don't miss this. This is important. So behold, okay, all this that he's just told us. He, he is faithful. It's true. These are things that must soon take place. And behold, I am coming quickly. Yes. He's putting his stamp on it. He's saying, I am coming quickly. Now, in case if you might miss this, in the next, in, in 16 verses, I'm going to tell it to you three times. I'm coming quickly, I'm coming quickly, and I'm coming quickly. Do you think he's coming quickly? Yes. So if we think it's not coming quickly, we're that three-year-old that can't wait for tomorrow. That, that, you know, are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? Okay. Because in God's view, he is coming that quickly. He tells us he's coming quickly here in verse 7. He's going to tell it to us in verse 12, and he's going to tell it again in verse 20. 
by a penny quickly, okay? He's also mentioned it, by the way, in Revelation 2, 5, verse 16 of chapter 2, and chapter 3, verse 11. So there's six times in this book that he tells us, I'm coming quickly, I'm coming quickly, I'm coming quickly. I'm going to take him at his word, folks. I'm going to plan on he's coming quickly, all right? And this is capturing now for us the final message that the Lord is giving to us. The final message. He knows this is going to be the end of the written word that we're going to call the Bible. And he's summing it up and saying, I'm coming quickly. Here. I'm coming quickly. Can't you just hear? Hang in there. Just just, just a little bit longer. Hang in there. I'm coming. I'm really coming. And I'm really coming quickly. It's going to happen. Ah, I love the way he reassures us. Because don't we need to do that for that little one that's so anxious? Wait. <laughs> Don't get discouraged. I'm coming. I'm coming quickly. I'm coming back to earth to rule and to reign. That's what he's talking about initially, but we also know all the rest of this will follow also. He, but he is talking when he, he says, you know, other things. But we've seen how he's talking about his time to come here to rule and to reign. In essence, the, the theme of the book of Revelation has been that all along. Because remember, it's the revealing of Yeshua in his glory. And remember, if we didn't have the book of Revelation, we wouldn't see his second coming in glory. We'd only be told he's coming a second time. But the only place we see it and the result of it and what happens is in the book of Revelation. We get sneak peeks from others, like Hezekiel, telling us what the temple will be like and how it will be filled with his glory. But that's tied into when it comes to the earth. And that's what we're seeing in the second coming. So when he's saying I'm coming quickly, he's coming back to rule and to reign. He's coming back in all of his glory. And that precedes our eternity here. But remember, we get to go be with him, to come back with him. So if he's coming all the sooner for this, that just makes it all the sooner for us. And I'm all for that. <laughs> so... And again, quickly, the idea being it's the very next thing on God's program. He has shown his program through time. He has planned law. He has planned promise. He has planned his first coming. He has planned his ascension. He has planned on the, the Holy Spirit coming. Remember he said, the Holy Spirit hasn't come yet because I haven't left. When I left, then the Holy Spirit will come. He's had us all planned. He had the millennium plan. But it would be better than what we got it. But he knew it wouldn't be the best yet. But all of this. He had it all planned. And he said that it is going to come, it's going to be sudden, it's going to be soon, and it's going to be surprising. Is that not true? Sudden, soon, and surprising. Hallelujah. No time for additional preparation when it's happening. When he's coming, he's coming. It's not that, oh, okay, I can see him coming and I'll get things right for the people that are living during those times. No. It's just like what we say for the rapture for us. It will happen suddenly, and you're either in or you're out. When his second coming comes, you are either in or you are out. When it comes to the point of the time of the judgment for who goes into the millennial kingdom, no one gets to stand there and say, um, I need a second chance, or uh, I didn't have long enough, or I was on the fence and I didn't make up my mind. There's no such thing as the fence, folks. You're either for the Lord or you are against the Lord. We use that as a, a symbolism of someone we see coming closer. And we would say we want the Holy Spirit, the wind, to fall over the fence into the right side. But really, if they were to suddenly die in that in-between state, they're going to uh, eternity without the Lord. They're not, oh, okay, well, they were almost there, so I'll give them points for credit and I'll sneak them in. No. So that's what the Lord's saying. You, you want to be ready? You have to be ready now. You don't get to be ready later. You don't get to argue it after you've died. You don't get to choose it your way. God said it. It is God's way. When you've come and done and created and put it in motion and kept it in motion and had a plan for <coughs> eternity, past, eternity, future, then you can make the rules. <laughs> but right now, you're in God's world and you're in His rules, whether you want to be in tune or not. The choice is yours because He won't force anyone. But the decision is now. We have to be ready now. Okay, also notice, behold, I come quickly, and then the next word, blessed. Do you know this book talks more about blessing than other books in the Bible? 
We were told all the way back in Revelation 1 and verse 3, if you study this book, you're promised a blessing. And here it comes again. Blessed is he who heeds the words of the prophecy of this book. Heeds the words, keeps them, lives their life according to them, watches them, guards them, is careful to be in tune with them. We're going to see when we get down to the, the final, final message um, that we're going to see. He warns them. Uh, verse... 18? 18. If you add to, the plagues are going to be added to you. If you take away your, your weight of the tree of life, living forever with him, is going to be taken away. Does that mean you can lose your salvation? No. No. And I'll make that very clear when we get there. That's not what it's saying. But the thought is, you don't tinker with God's word. You don't add to it, and you don't take away there are cults that do exactly that. They add on other books and they equate them equal or higher than God's work here. That's when you know it's false. Get out and get away. If they take away and say, oh, well, you can't have this. This isn't for you. Go away. Go away. Don't even listen to them. The whole Bible is for us. That doesn't mean that every part was to us. When he was writing to the children of Israel, something specific for the children of Israel before they entered the promised land, obviously, that's not written to us in 2019. That was to them then. But can we apply? Can we learn? Can we see, hey, they didn't stay in fellowship with their God and they missed out on their promise? Well, I'm given a promise here, a blessing, if I adhere to this, if I stay in the Word, if I'm studying, if I'm learning. I think... I'm going to stick there because I think if God didn't allow them to get their reward, I'll lose my reward. Notice I said reward. You're not going to lose your salvation. But you will miss out on a blessing now. If God asks you to do something now and you don't do it, you miss out on a blessing. It's not going to go undone. God's going to give it to someone else to do it. It's going to be their blessing. His plan isn't going to be thwarted. No one's going to miss heaven because you didn't speak to them. But you will miss out on a blessing of being the one who led them to the Lord possible. And you won't receive the Lord. That's what's being said here. All of this in this. Be careful. Guard the Lord of God. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Psalm 119, 105. Or 11. 11. I always mix up the two. Is it 11? Okay. Look at both verses. They're good. <laughs> the idea is we need to be in his word. We need to know his word and we need to be applying his word. We can apply it from Bereshit Genesis to Revelation from the beginning to the end. Even if it is speaking specifically like the promises given to Israel, we again glean and learn and apply from it. All of the word of God is inerrant. I wanted more words. I'm fighting my words. I'm trying to hurt because I know my tongue is absolutely gone. But all of it is perfect. It, it, I'm thinking of um, 2 Timothy 3.16. Let's just look at it because my mind's racing and I'm not going to say it right. <coughs> okay, come on, 2 Timothy. That one won't do. We're going to get it. We're going to 2 Timothy 3.16. And no, it's not in your cross-references. I'm throwing it in for free. <laughs> okay, judge you. All scripture is God breathed, is valuable for teaching the truth, for convicting of sin, for correcting faults, for training in right living. Thus, anyone who belongs to God may be fully equipped for every good work. Everything we need is in the Word of God. Every answer to every problem, every direction, every everything, whatever you need. Get into prayer and get into the word, and you will find your answer. It will be there. That's the blessing of heeding the word of God. It's not just the prophecy book. It's not just revelation that that saying is meaning far more than that. Okay? Um, real quick, because I want to time my thought up completely, go back to Revelation 22 and go to verse 8. And I, Yochanan, I, John, and the one who heard and saw these things, He's starting to write his signature, and he's putting his stamp on it. Hey, this is me. I saw it. I heard it. What he's saying is, I didn't get it secondhand. I'm telling you, I saw it. I'm telling you, I heard it. This is my testimony. That's what he's saying. When I heard and saw it, I love it. He's as human as the rest of us. I 
what did I do? I fell down to worship at the feet of the angel who showed me these things. He's so overwhelmed. He is so in awe that he just absolutely falls down to worship the angel who has been showing it to him. And remember, when, this is a repeat. I think it was chapter 19. Chapter 19 of verse 10. He fell down and worshiped the angel there. And the angel said, don't do it, John. Don't do it, Yonan. Get up. The only one you worship or fall down and worship to is God, Jehovah, the Father, or Yeshua, Jesus, the Son. It's not me. It's not an angel. Well, he either didn't learn his lesson, and I don't <laughs> think that's what the problem is. I, he's so overwhelmed, so blown away, so yeah, beyond no. himself, <laughs> and so appreciative of, of this one who showed it to him, who is angelic in, 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 in front of him. He was in awe. He just again fell down, and the worship's just pouring out of him. But again, the angel is very, very careful. Don't worship me. Worship God. Worship him alone. Because who am I? Verse 9 tells us, He, the angel, said to Yochanan, Don't do that. I'm a fellow servant of yours, of your brethren the prophets, and those who heed the words of this book. Three groups of people there to see real quickly. He, these angels are fellow servants of God with us. Okay, I'm a fellow servant of yours. Remember the angels are amazed looking at what God did for the humans. And it says that they're, in Hebrews 1, verse 13 and 14, it says that they are ministering to those who are about to receive the, the error of salvation, which we know we're saved, but we receive it tangibly when we're home in heaven. We just know it. We're, we're guaranteed it by the Holy Spirit. But the angels are, are there to minister to us, and that's what the angels say. I'm, I'm a fellow servant with you. I get to worship God with you, but I'm here to serve you also because that's where, the way God has put us. And the brethren, the prophets, we angels were here to serve the prophets also. Remember when Elisha prayed, Lord God, open the eyes of Gehazi, my servant, because he was, there's more of them than there are of us. We're going down. This is it. This is it. Did you do your will, Elisha? Because we're not getting out of this alive. And Elisha said, no, God. In the days of the vernacular, cool your jets, man. <laughs> Look at all God's got. And he saw the whole host of heaven. He saw angelic beings there to fight for them. That's who we have at our bedroom call to worthy the Lord. We don't call and ask the angels. We don't pray to the angels. They're our fellow servants. They're in essence almost lower than us in the sense that they serve us. But we ask the Lord for protection, for safety, for the warring angels to come and fight the battle. And they do at God's bedroom. Call. That's who is here. And also, fellow servant of, of yours, Yochanan, of your brother and the prophets, and of those who heed the words of the book. Again, that's who we are. We're heeding the words of the book. And then who are they to worship? Worship. Give all your worship to God. God and God alone. Give it all and let it go there. And why I'm hurrying is because now here's where we were talking about verse 10. And I'll go over verse 9 and 10 next week because I always do when I hurry in the end. Um, verse 10 tells us, he said to me, do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this book for the time is near. The time is soon. Now we'll do it next week because we're really past time. But if you want to go look ahead, if you want to go for the completion of what I said, go to Daniel 8.26 and chapter 12 verse 4 and verses 8 through 10 in chapter 12. In all of those, you are going to see that God's telling Daniel, you're not even going to understand it all, Daniel. You're a man of God, prophet, priest, and a prophet, um, prayer, and purpose. Thank you. He great shining example. But even you, Daniel, you're not going to understand it all. It's not for you because it's not the time. But we don't hear him say that to Yochanan. In Yochanan, he says, heed it. Don't steal it up. Get it out. Tell it, the time is now. You see how we've moved on God's calendar? Yeah, it's soon. Yes, it's imminent. Yes, it can happen now. That's why it needs to be open and why it excites us to study it because we are seeing the final chapters Hallelujah. and the final words of God's plan to us. So you said Daniel 826 and what? 12 4 and 12 8 through 10. And it is on your cross references. Yeah. So you said that we won't understand it it's because there's too much to understand. So that when it does happen, we'll understand it as it's being ruled out. Right, but, but Daniel, Daniel was one being told, 
he won't understand it, Daniel. When he asked, what does all this mean? God said, it's not for you to understand, Daniel, because it wasn't going to happen in Daniel's day. He doesn't tell you know, John that. When John's trying to figure it out, he says, here it is. But we don't fully understand because we're not living through it. Those who are living through that time, this Bible's going to be their greatest companion. When they want to know what's going to come next, they're going to be able to read it and understand it. They're going to know when that mark comes. I'm not taking that mark because I see here, God said that's what was going to happen. Anybody who takes this mark is condemned to hell because they're getting their allegiance to, to Satan. I'm not going to be a party of that. They're going to have such a road map that it's going to be so clear. And it's going to encourage them because when it's so bad, they can look and say, well, you know what? We know we're in the last three and a half years. We know that the abomination, and let's just throw out, let's just say, okay? The abomination is at the three and a half year point. So right now we are July 2019. So let's go forward three years to 2022 and let's go a half a year to January. Okay? So January 2022, if I did my math right, is three and a half years from now. It's either 22 or 23. I may have shortened it a year. But let's say that people disappear. We see things happen. We, they see things happening. They've gotten saved now. Now they know they're in that first part, and then they see at, and I'll just say it, January 24th, 2022, the abomination of desolation was put in the temple to be worshipped. They know, they're told, get out, get away, go, go hide. They know it's three and a half years now. So they can be literally counting down time, encouraging themselves, hanging on for that end to come. And the beautiful part is, the Lord says he's going to shorten those days because if he didn't, no one would be left alive. So they won't even have to make it all the way through to another exact three and a half years. It will be very close. It will be close enough. Like when we throw out something and say, well, you know, he was three and a half and maybe, maybe he was three years and seven months or he was three years in this case and five months. But we called it three and a half because it was close enough. But in that end when it's going to be so hard to hold on with those last plates. The horrors, remember, they can assure themselves, even this, the Lord's coming any moment because he promised to cut it short. And when they see so many people being killed, being devastated, okay, I get it, Lord. And you said somebody's still going to be left alive. If you're going to keep your word, you've got to come back now. And here he comes. So they'll understand even better than we are looking at it. And we think, like like we think, okay, we know today how we think the technology will be for the mark of the beast. But a hundred years ago, they had no idea that technology. So the closer we get, the more we understand. But they will exactly understand. No one's going to take that mark by accident and stand before the Lord one day and say, I didn't know that's what that was. I didn't know that's what that meant. No, they're going to know. They're going to understand completely because they're living through it and they've got the word God right there and the spirit of God to present it to them in understandable language. But Daniel, who prophesied about a lot of this, was told, still that it's not the right time. John's told it is the right time. Daniel was 700 BC, sorry, 500, 586 BC, right in here, because he was in the first wave of captivity. Um, so we know that John was at least, well, let's round it off, 600 years later than that. And the Lord said, you've moved in my timing. So the fact that we're almost 2,000 years beyond that says to me, we have got to be right on the edge. I mean, it just, it has to be, or, or what God says doesn't make sense, and God always makes sense. So, do I want to encourage you? Yes. If we're here next week, because we haven't been caught up, we'll come back and we'll finish the book, okay? I can't believe it. I don't know whether to shout hallelujah or sit out and cry. <laughs> but we'll finish it up next week if we don't finish it around his feet. Because I believe it's that imminent. That as my dad would always say, I will see you here, there, or in the air. <laughs> yes. so, let's close in prayer, short quick prayer, because I know people have got to go. Lord God, thank you. Thank you for your sure, precious, true words of promise. Thank you for revealing it to us. Thank you the Spirit helps us understand. Thank you we get to go home, even possibly today, and be with you forever. Thank you for your magnanimous plan, but thank you for being an ineffable, the ineffable God. 
to you before, forever and ever and ever, and we all say hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Okay. All right.